so this is our security room to maintain regulatory standards and the highest level of compliance in Michigan you're required to have cameras on covering every part of the facility and you have to be able to see any person in the facilities front and back at all times so that means two angles um, we also have four cameras in every single flower room we're constantly monitoring the cameras we have someone uh, who's doing you know 24 7 security we always have eyes on these obviously in this industry turnover is big but also theft um, so a lot of a lot of trimmers and you know entry-level employees in the past have you know stolen product not at this facility but at our our sister facility in Washington we've experienced problems with theft usually minor theft you know a half an ounce or an ounce nothing crazy but that makes us non-compliant if someone steals so we're constantly monitoring the employees reminding them that they're on camera because if one person steals a couple grams in their glove and although it doesn't affect us financially very much when you know someone takes a small amount of cannabis legally and as far as compliance goes that can risk our entire license it can risk the millions of dollars on the line everybody's jobs and everything that we've worked so hard for so obviously security is you know really important to us and we take it very seriously as far as compliance goes So this is the mother room and clone room. We keep mothers of the plants so we can keep the exact genetics that we uh, previously had. The reason that they're called mothers is because they're all female. And basically when you take a mother like this, these top nodes, each one of these can become a new plant. So when I cut this off, I can use this as a clone and put it into a new soil cube, a new rock wool cube, and it'll create an exact replica of the mother giving me a female with the same genetics, guaranteeing I'm not gonna have any males, and therefore no pollen, which can lead to seeds. Um, we keep all females in the facility. We don't do any pollinating here. All of our breeding projects are off-site, just to ensure that we don't have any potential pollen that could hermaphrodite or cause our plants to seed. And now I'll show you how to do uh, the actual cloning process. Um, it starts by cutting off each of the uh, additional nodes. I'm going to remove any side nodes to clean it up. Move this inner node right here. And then we're going to give her the haircut. We cut the leaves down so the plant focuses more on rooting than leaf growth. I'm going to shorten the plant a little bit on a diagonal 45 degree cut. So I'm shaving off the skin walls of the plant just so it has more uh, surface area to penetrate roots through the, uh, the plant wall for the, uh, the new baby clone. So I'm gonna dip the clone now in the rooting gel. This seals the outside of the plant tissue wall, allowing the roots to uh, be protected against it, the air and the environment. And then I put the clone in the block and I have an exact replica of the genetics from the mother and this will become a new plant. So this is where the clones go after they're put into the rooting cubes. You can tell that this dome is a fresh one because it's very humid inside. So when the clones are babies, they like a lot of warmth and humidity. And then as time goes on, we crack the lids so there's less humidity in the domes and then eventually take the domes off completely to get the babies acclimated to the new environment. Um, if you didn't put the dome on them, they would all die right away because they wouldn't have enough moisture in the air. Um, another thing about veg and the mother and clone process is the lights in here are all on 18 hours a day and they're off for six hours a day. This keeps the plants in their vegetative cycle. So you'll notice all of these clones and all of the mothers that I was showing you don't have any flowers or buds on them. That's because the lights are on 18 hours a day. So the plants think it's summertime. When the lights are switched to 12 hours a day and 12 hours off, they flip into flower. This is because the, the light changing basically signals to the plants that fall and winter are coming, which causes the plants to reproduce, causing the females to produce buds, or the males, um, which we don't have here, would produce pollen. Um, the reason we don't have any males in the building is because if the pollen gets on the females, they'll get pollinated and produce seeds instead of flower. I'll show you now how to, um, how to crack the humidity dome. So as the clones become more mature, we acclimate, acclimate them to the environment by decreasing the humidity. 
that starts by opening these air vents to allow air in. We do this for about 30 minutes a day to start, and then later the air vents become even more open on the second day and the third day. After they've acclimated some and gotten some air in there, then every day we start to take the domes off. We'll take them off, like for example with these clones, the dome's only gonna go off for 10 seconds. These are very new clones, so I'm gonna allow them to burp, get some air in there, and then put the dome back on. When you put the dome on, you gotta make sure you get it around all the plants, and you don't crush any babies, so the seedlings are safe. I'm looking for spider mites, so spider mites, russet mites, thrips, aphids. Typically, when I look at the bottoms of the leaves, that's when I'm looking for bugs. If there were spider mites, you would see them pop up like salt and pepper. The, uh, the black pepper is the spider mite, and then the white part, the salt, would be their eggs. Luckily, all the plants are looking good. We don't have any uh, infestation issues or, um, or microbial issues either, so I also look for bud rot. Look for powdery mildew, different molds that can happen on the cannabis. Um, but our plants are looking great and very healthy. And this is thanks to our IPM program, that's Integrated Pest Management. So the IPM program, um, part of that is actually these bugs right here. So these packs have beneficial bugs in them. Some of them are spikele and some of them are swirsky. So the spikels eat spider mites while the swirskies eat russet mites. So these are basically good bugs that we deploy into the room to eat all of the bad bugs. Um, that's, that's why they're called predatory mites. And then another part of the IPM system would be you know, spraying pesticides and keeping the rooms very clean, wearing gloves at all times, making sure people go through contamination procedures when they enter the facility. Uh, people will wear different shoes in our facility to make sure they're not bringing any of the filth or bugs or dirt from the outside. And um, we take our cross-contamination very seriously because IPM is a very important part of the system. Uh, one outbreak of bugs or mold could, could ruin your whole crop and your entire business. So this is our irrigation setup. Each one of these barrels has a different concentrated mix in it. This is our flowering setup here specifically. So we have our base nutrient, our flower nutrient, and then our pH neutralizer. These, um, these mixing uh, dosing containers are gonna pull up the concentration and ex the exact ratios that we need for our, our um, IP and our, our nutrient mix. Um, basically, all the water is filtered through an RO filter to clean out any potential um, heavy metals, mycotoxins, any, any dirt or filth that could be in the water. Um, and then as they go down, you're gonna actually be able to see on the wall, be able to read our PPM, our, our temperature and our pH that we're running this batch at. Um, and that allows us to just monitor the water and make sure that it's, you know, it's dialed in to where we need it to be. We do all of the irrigation ourselves. So we run the same irrigation in all of the different states. And then we actually have an app that we've coded ourselves that controls the irrigation. And we know exactly how much water the plants need at every week of the plant cycle. So, you know, in veg versus flower, they're gonna be getting different amounts. And we actually have it dialed in to how many seconds of water the plants are getting every 30 minutes. So we can achieve a perfect dry back. This allows the plants to get water dry back, get water, dry back, and they'll actually dry back 10 to 20 times in a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just um, so the, the plants are actually absorbing all of those nutrients and then going through that cycle again. So these are the metric tags. They are great for traceability and chain of custody, but the way that metric makes us have to use them can be very cumbersome at times. You'll notice they're just plastic tags. They do have an RFID chip inside of them. Um, so they do actually, you know, trace everything. You can see that RFID strip in there. Um, but again, metric, you know, is in all the states. They basically have a monopoly on the compliance business in cannabis you know, causing them to sometimes charge very high fees. Since they're the only option that we have, we have to use metric. Um, you know, it, it's great because it, 
It forces a lot of people that are from the old school of cannabis that have never done it on a commercial scale. Um, it forces them to follow traceability and compliance rules. And we have no problem, you know, maintaining the highest level of compliance because a lot of our, you know, founders are from different industries that maintain very high regulatory compliance levels. But that being said, some of the steps that they make you go through are cumbersome. For example, when we defoliate leaves and we cut leaves out, we have to weigh all of the leaves by tray. And we have to actually take those leaves, even if they're vegetative leaves that have no THC on them and can't get you high, we still have to take those leaves and mix them 50-50 with either dirt or pebbles or cement, anything non-cannabis. And we actually have to grind all of the waste, mix it with the dirt, and then weigh it and track it by tray and where it came from. So in the HPS rooms, you know, the lights are very bright and very powerful. So we, we have all of our employees wear safety protective glasses. Um, this both obviously protects your eyes, but it also filters the light so you can see the natural colors of the cannabis a lot easier. We actually have the same filter on the camera right now that is on these glasses. So when I look at the plants, I can see all of the colors without being drowned out by the orange light. And when I take them off, whoa, I'm blinded. So we use the LEDs as well as the HPS lights in flower because we like to experiment with new technology and LED technology triples every 18 months. LEDs are also much more cost effective on the electrical bill and much more environmentally sustainable because of their uh, lower use of power. They are very expensive, the fixtures, so that's why we only have a couple rooms that are LEDs because with the technology getting better and growing as fast as it is, we don't wanna buy all LEDs for a facility and then have a newer, better LED come out. So we've actually been doing R&D with the LED lights for five years out in Washington. Um, and these are the ones that we've selected for our Michigan facility. And they, they, they work great. You can see under the LEDs that you actually get some more color out of the plants. That's both because of the full spectrum and because you, it's actually easier to see that color under the LED lights than it is under the, uh, the orange hue of the HPS lights. So you can see that the bud almost looks like it's covered in frost. This frost are the trichomes, which are the glandular heads that hold all of the THC, CBD, different cannabinoids, and terpenes. So all of the good stuff is in the frost, and that's why you'll often hear people call a bud frosty. So this is the dry room. And here the plants come right after they're cut down. So you might have seen them going on the rack earlier. They go on that sanitized rack and they come straight into here and then they're hung. We keep our dry room at a, you know, a very specified humidity and temperature that we actually change throughout the dry process to make sure that we're getting a, you know, the best, slowest dry possible. One of the things that we do here is we really take our time with the dry. Typically our drying process is between 12 and 14 days. And during that process, you're gonna lose about 80 to 85% of the moisture content in the plants. So let's say you harvest 500 pounds of wet product out of the room. Once it's dry, it's gonna shrink down, lose that moisture, and it's gonna be about 100 pounds of product. Um, after it's done in the dry room, it goes into the cure bags where it's, it'll be bucked and it's a similar process to trimming where they just cut the buds off the plant into bags and then um, the product will be trimmed and it goes on to be cured for about two weeks and then we get it tested by the lab and it's ready to sell. So by, even after the plant is cut down, it's still a good five weeks until it's ready to be sold. The dry and cure is really a 
big part of the process in terms of determining the quality of the final, mm -hmm. the final smoke or the final product. Mm -hmm. um, the smoothness of it comes out a lot. So part of this process, you know, doing it slowly allows the plants to slowly let go of the moisture. If you dry it too fast, it's going to come out really harsh um, and not be as enjoyable of a, of a finished product. Shave the outside of the bud, clean up all the leaves until it looks like a perfectly manicured bud. Get all that brown out of there, any leaves that turn dark, you really want to make sure you get those. And this is, you know, this process is a big balance between speed and quality, obviously. So all of the, all of the trim that comes off of the plants, this will all be used for extract. So there's still THC on these leaves, just not very much, and it's not very pleasant to smoke. So we'll extract that for different, um, different products like shatter, batter, cured resin. If we were to freeze the trim, then we would make live resin with it, which is a, you know, a, you know, a different kind of extract that's come up from a fresh frozen, uh, Plant. But since this is dry material, it'll most likely go to either shatter or, um, or distillate, for example. Here's the trim. So it's about, um, it's about 15 to 20% is trim. Um, typically when you, when you have like a bucked plant, you're going to lose about 20% that's all trim. Basically, you know, use the whole buffalo. That's our, that's our motto. And, even the stems you can use. We don't use the stems at our cannabis facility, but on the hemp side, you can use the stems to, uh, to make grain or herd, which can be used to you know, make building materials, different textiles, clothing, etc. cetera. Um, the, you know, the benefits of the cannabis plant go far beyond medicinal and recreational. Um, the industrial uses are also quite, quite exciting. Okay, so we've brought us the batch here for sampling. The first thing is that we're going to record and verify the information. So we've got honey bun. And we'll record the metric tracking ID number on this package. And the weight of 12.15 pounds. Now we'll give us the required sample size we pull half a percent of the batch to make sure that we're collecting a representative sample. So in this case, we're going to need to pull 29.6 grams from this batch. So now Casey will go ahead and label her bag just so we can track it back with what we're doing. And then we're also going to take a look at the batch just to make sure that we've got access to the entirety of the batch. Plausibility that this is actually 12 pounds, which it is. We've seen lots of samples, so We've got a pretty good idea of what that looks like. We'll look through, make sure it, there's no evidence of mixing multiple strains or multiple batches or anything like that. Everything's uniform shape, size, and color, which it appears to be. I'll take some notes. Casey puts on a second clean glove, and she's going to begin pulling incremental samples. 1.9. Okay. We want everything in the batch to be represented for this sample. If um, a lot of times producers will sort out different sizes or different grades of buds within the same batch, which is fine to do, but we still are going to pull samples from each of those sections of the batch. Um, sometimes we'll give it to the producer the option to see if they want them tested separately and they can split it up into separate batches and we can test each of them individually if they're looking for maybe the smaller ones are going to test slightly lower potency, the you know, grade A buds will test a higher potency. Okay, now that Casey's uh, collected the required sample, she's gonna go ahead and seal the bag. We'll fold it down a few times, pinch it, and then... Grab some custody. Yep, she's gonna put some custody seal tape on it to start the chain of custody from the, uh, this producer to the lab.
We're gonna record that final weight after it's been custody sealed. And then we, we will affix the metric transfer tag to the package as well as a copy to our paperwork. And then we will bring this to the producer to create a manifest for us to bring it back to the lab. Put our stuff right there. All right. And all the batch and weight information is on there. So she's going to go ahead and make the package and the transfer in the state tracking system now, which is required for us to move the sample from this facility back to our lab for testing. Okay, so now that she's made that tag, the next step will be to make a transfer to transfer it over to us. For that, she's gonna need all of our travel information, which Casey can go ahead and give her now. So at the, uh, the end of sampling, the last thing we need to do is create a transfer to send the product from this facility back to our lab for testing. So they have to log that in metric, which is the state tracking system. Um, and it requires, in addition to details such as what tests they want done and the amount of sample that we took, we've got to have route information that we're traveling, um, driver's information for who's transporting it, vehicle information. Um, it's very detailed. So it's all to you know, maintain that chain of custody. So she's just putting all that in right now for us and finishing it up, and then we'll get a printout double check and we'll be on our way. So this is uh, the copy of that state transfer manifest. Casey's going to double check it all for accuracy before we leave. And if everything looks good, she will sign a copy for the producer to keep on file and then sign and retain a copy for us.